Welcome seventh graders to the Dallas Independent School District STEM Environmental Education Center. We'd like to give a special welcome to the seventh graders at the Young Men's Leadership Academy at Fred Florence Middle School and to the seventh graders at DESA, the Dallas Environmental Science Academy. Thank you for so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we wish you could be here in person, but we're going to do our best to make you feel like you're here during a virtual field trip. This is our third seventh grade virtual field trip of the school year but first using Zoom. So if we have any te technical difficulties, bear with us. Um, I think we've got this though. Um, if you are watching this and have not registered for this field trip yet, you can register by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register. There you'll fill out a pretty short form to um, get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. We just use that information for our attendance purposes. Today's uh, virtual field trip is going to be all about forces that affect motion in organisms. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that there is a relationship among force, motion, and energy. Students will observe forces that affect motion in organisms such as emergence of seedlings, turgor pressure, geotropism, and the circulation of blood. So we're gonna start off this morning by exploring the emergence of seedlings, and that's gonna be led by Mr. Mirez. Then we're going to explore turgor pressure with Ms. Nash. Then we're going to explore geotropism with Mrs. Fuller. And last, we'll explore the circulation of blood with Mr. Monroe. Almost appropriate since it's about Halloween time. While we're doing all of that, uh, you can ask us questions. How you ask questions is by going to a website, which is www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer. And there you will get to a super short form um, where you can type in any question you have for us related, related to how forces affect the motion in organisms. You can ask us as many questions as you like, and we will do our best to answer all of them for you in the time that we have with you this morning. So let's get started with the trip. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen here and hand it over to Ms. Ramirez, who is going to start off with the emergence of seedlings. Hello, my name is Ms. Ramirez, and in this segment, we're gonna be learning what forces affect the motion of plants, such as the emergence of seedlings. Uh, so as we take a look at some examples of seeds, be thinking about what forces might affect how they germinate. So what I'm gonna do first, I'm just gonna show you some quick examples of seeds, uh, just so we can look at some interesting ones. So be thinking about how seeds are able to push their way through soil in order to germinate. So the first few seeds we're gonna look at um, are just some common seeds that you guys have probably seen before. Um, in fact, a lot of us actually eat seeds. So we're in the season of fall right now and everything's all pumpkin flavored. So we actually have some pumpkin seeds and I like to eat these toasted. We also have some uh, pea seeds. We have some watermelon seeds. Uh, we also have sunflower seeds as well. Those are commonly sold in stores. And then of course, everyone always likes to plant uh, lima beans, especially in elementary school. They have a very quick germination rate and they're easy uh, to germinate. So there's our lima bean. And then also I have an example of an avocado seed. So I love to eat avocados. I tried planting a few of them before, but I guess I didn't plant them deep enough and the squirrels ended up getting them. So that's the avocado. And then a common seed that students find out here at the environmental center are actually the acorns. So here we have um, a burr oak acorn, and it, it's one of the largest acorns that we have here. And then we have another acorn. Now something interesting is Texas actually has over 50 species of oak trees. And uh, just for your own benefit, um, y'all probably started talking about genus and species. So the genus of oak is Quercus, and then the species will depend on uh, the exact type. So this one is the burr oak has the largest acorn that we have here, and its scientific name is uh, Quercus macrocarpa. And again, it, I guess it gets that name macro because it is rather big. And so a lot of people don't realize that if you actually plant um, a good healthy acorn, it can actually germinate. So when the squirrels are burying those acorns during the fall so that they have their winter stash, those that don't get eaten uh, will eventually germinate under the right conditions. So that's a good example of a seed you might be able to find around your uh, neighborhood. Other examples of seeds, as I show you guys these, be also thinking about seed dispersal methods. So here we have uh, something interesting, it's called devil's claw, and the way it disperses, it will attach onto an animal's leg or its foot, and the animal will carry it away, and then it can disperse that way. So that's an interesting looking one. Uh, pine cones also bear seeds inside of them. 
Uh, this is a lotus pod. Um, I get a lot of kids when I show them this, they always tell me they have trypophobia, and that is just uh, the aversion or fear of uh, clusters of holes. So I was surprised that the little ones even know what that word means. Uh, so there's our lotus pod, and you can see the seeds inside. Uh, we also have sweet gum pods as well. We also have these spiky burrs. Uh, so their method of seed dispersal is also through um, attachment to other animals. So they have these curved spikes um, on the burrs that attach to the fur of animals. When I was a kid, we used to throw these at each other and they would get stuck on our clothes or our hair. Uh, we also have uh, different dried flowers that have seed pods as well. And then of course, various different kinds of nuts. This one is a hickory nut uh, from across the street in the preserve. So think about methods of seed dispersal whenever you do find uh, seeds outside. So now we're gonna go ahead and focus on forces. So a force is just a push or a pull that can change the motion of an object. And forces are everywhere. They affect you and me as well as our plants as well. So the most common force that affects our plants would be gravity. And gravity is just the downward force that draws objects toward the center of the earth. And seedlings, they can only emerge from the soil when they move upward, exerting a force on the soil greater than the downward force of gravity. So let me show you an example of what that means. If we pretend that this is actually the Earth's surface and this is the soil, I'm gonna have to exert enough force uh, to lift the box open or to help this plant uh, emerge from the soil in our demonstration. So you have to exert, or the plant has to exert enough force greater than the force of gravity in order to push its way through the soil. So that's where gravity comes in play uh, with germination. So let's take a look at our little uh, diagram here. So here we have a little seedling and here's this word. I got stuck on it yesterday, so I'm gonna try and say it really slow today. Uh, it is the cotyledon, <laughs> try saying that five times all day. Um, so that's the cotyledon. Um, and what that is, it is just the uh, embryonic leaves within a seed. And this uh, part of a seed has an important job. So within the seed, we all plants and all components have uh, cells. And in those cells, there are organelles called vacuoles. Those vacuoles store water, and that's important for turgor pressure. So a seed has to have enough turgor pressure in order to bust through the seed coat. And when it has enough turgor pressure, um, that root, that tap root can bust out of the seed coat and then start the process of germination. So here we have our little tap root, it's pushing through the seed coat. And again, that can only happen when there's enough turgor pressure. And then once we have the roots, they're gonna start to grow downward due to uh, positive geotropism. And you'll learn about that in another segment. Uh, so geotropism is just uh, the movement uh, related to gravity. So positive geotropism is just the roots moving down in the same direction as gravity. Now when the seed starts to germinate, it's going to grow up. It's growing against gravity and we call that negative geotropism because it's going against gravity. And then once that happens, uh, once the root starts to grow down, then the cotyledon will um, eventually move its way up and it's going to move up because it's going toward the light and what's called phototropism and you'll learn again about that in another segment and then here we have an example here with our cotyledon um, that cotyledon is an important part of a seedling because it actually stores energy uh, so once the plant the new plant has used up all the energy in that cotyledon uh, the cotyledon may drop off and then the new true leaves will start to form. Um, so that's some of the steps that are common in germination. And so what we're going to do next, I'm actually going to share my screen with you guys and we're going to watch a time lapse video of an oak tree that is starting to germinate. So let me see if I can um, figure this out. So I'm going to screen share with you guys my desktop and let's see. Hopefully you guys are able to see this. Um, so we have uh, turgor pressure. So remember that word that I mentioned earlier. So that's turgor pressure. And here's a good diagram of that turgor pressure. So inside plant cells, that turgor pressure must be high enough in order to push um, the plant through the soil. So again, that force has to be greater than the force of gravity. So here we have a turgid plant cell and this big organelle here is the vacuole. 
that vacuole is what's going to store the water. And that's why it's important that we, when you plant seeds, they have adequate water so that their cells have good turgor pressure. Those seeds will soak up uh, the water in their cells that increases the turgor pressure. And once they have enough turgor pressure, uh, the embryo can break out of the seed coat. So that's turgor pressure. And then here's our little time lapse video of our acorn sapling. So I'm gonna go ahead and show that with you guys. So again, the cotyledon, oh, I said it right this time. The cotyledon has to have enough turgor pressure um, in its cells to break through the seed coat. So you can see it's breaking through right now. And again, that turgor pressure is just related to the water pressure that's inside the vacuoles of the cell. And you can see the seed coat has been pushed off. The seed will grow a taproot that pushes down toward the soil. And then here you see a shoot will then grow upward. So that growth upward would be negative geotropism because it's going against gravity. And all pr plants can sense the direction of the gravitational field and orient themselves accordingly. So the motion of that motion is called geotaxis and the process itself is referred to as geotropism. So let me go ahead and show you one last one. Um, for those that are teachers with NDISD, you can actually um, get seeds from the DISD um, Living Materials Center. So if you're interested in doing some sort of germination project, there's lots of seeds that are available for y'all. Um, so these would be some good introductory videos. So here's one for lima beans. And again, it, the lima beans have a similar process. You'll see the taproot right over here on this one is starting to break through that seed coat. So its, seed, its cells had enough turgor pressure to allow it to bust through that seed coat. And then you're starting to see here on the left, the cotyledon will start to be pushed upward. And again, it's moving upward because it's orienting itself toward the light. And that's phototropism. And when they start to emerge, you'll notice that the lima beans actually have two cotyledons. And so we refer to them as dicots. Oaks are also dicots as well. And again, you can see the cotyledons uh, right here. And then here are the first true leaves that are starting to emerge out. And sometimes these cotyledons uh, will eventually drop once their food storage is used up. People like to use lima beans because they have a quick germination rate, uh, usually between seven and 14 days. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop it there. And uh, just a couple of things. I showed you some seeds earlier. This is just some examples. If you do a Google search for weird or interesting seed pods, uh, seeds come in many different forms and they can also disperse in many different ways. Uh, so there's some very interesting seeds that you guys can find while you're out and about enjoying nature. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, unshare my screen. So let me see if I can get that back. And then we will, hmm. oh now I can't see myself. So let's see if I can do this again. I might be stuck. <laughs> there I am. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. And then one last question for you guys. Um, some other factors that affect germination. So these factors are not forces like gravity, but they're just other things that might affect germination. So things like temperature, the soil type. So think about whether it's compacted clays, loose sands, or rocky type soil. Uh, for example, where I live, it's a lot of clay and sand and I cannot get anything to grow. Uh, the seed depth. So remember I was telling you about the avocado that I tried planting and I didn't plant it deep enough and squirrels ate it. So if you plant things too shallow, they are subject to predation by animals. They can get eaten. Uh, the water can wash them away. But if you plant them too deep, uh, they're gonna have to exert more force and energy and able to germinate and push through all those layers of soil. Um, also pH of the soil, the amount of nutrients, so whether you add fertilizer, the amount of water and the amount of light also affect, are also factors that affect germination. So something cool you can do is uh, design your own um, investigative study 
and explore the effects of some of these other uh, factors on germination. Um, and that's all I have for you guys today on germination. We're going to go ahead and pass it back to Mr. Broughton, and he's going to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. Um, the question that came in was, uh, do all seeds um, emerge um, at the same time from the, from the soil? And the answer to that is no, and, that, and Ms. Um, Ramirez already kind of explained that, but um, not all seeds germinate at the same rate. Some seeds germinate very quickly, like uh, the cabbage family seeds. So bok choy, broccoli, kale, cauliflower, lettuce can germinate in as little as one day. Uh, radishes germinate very quickly as well. Other seeds are slow to germinate, like bell peppers, eggplants, fennel, celery, um, and then some are kind of medium. Um, they only take a few days to germinate, like tomatoes, beets, chard, squash, onions. So different seeds germinate at different uh, uh, number of days. And then um, also if you plant them at different depths, they're not going to emerge as quickly as if you were planting them shallow, but you don't want to plant them too shallow either. So anyway, they, they don't all um, emerge as seedlings at the exact same time. All right, now we're going to uh, move to Miss Nash with turgor pressure. Okay, there we are. Welcome, welcome to my classroom. And today we're talking about turtle pressure. But before we begin, let me just say that seed germination is such an interesting subject. There are some seeds that have to be eaten by an animal and then excreted before they'll germinate. And there are all other seeds that can germinate after a hundred years. So pretty amazing the seed was a great idea that plants had. Now, today we're talking about turtle. So turtle pressure is a key to plant life. Without it, we would not have the plants with still So turgo pressure, kind of a weird word, like some strange group from Star Trek, the Turgorian Empire. Turgo pressure. And <clears throat> it's just water pressure, which I mean said inside the cell of the plant. And it's exerted by this big thing right here. Takes up in some cases 90% of the volume. Of the plant cell, and that thing is called the vacuole. Animal cells do not have a vacuole, and water moves into it by osmosis. And in an animal cell, all that water might cause the cell to burst because the, the membrane is not strong enough to hold it in. So plant cells, luckily for them, have a cell wall around. They have a membrane, but then they have a cell wall. And the cell wall is made of cellulose. The cellulose is very strong enough to make paper out of it. And in some parts of the plant, it also has an even stronger thing called lignin. Another great word, lignin. And lignin is super strong. And that's what allows trees to get enormously tall, have those huge heavy limbs in the wind, and they don't break really strong, lignin, so stiff shell, strong and rooted. Now, without turgor pressure, the plant will wilt. So without water, plants will wilt. So yesterday, or day before yesterday, actually, I picked this off, this beautiful plant, I felt bad. Okay. I felt bad. And in a day, it wilted, lost its turtle pressure because the leaves are always losing a little bit of, of water, water vapor, and it will wilt. Now, if I put it in water, it might revive. It may be too late for this one. If you see a plant that's wilting, it means I need water. However, this time of year, you may see some that are wilting. These leaves have lost their total pressure. But if I water the plant, even though the plant's not dead, these leaves will not come back. Not just because they've gotten too, too dried up, you can hear that crackling, but because it's fall. And this plant is going to lose the leaves over the winter. So it's not pumping water in there anymore. That little incision layer has formed, and now the leaf is cut off. Okay. 
from the source of water. Now, the water moves up to the leaves to the stems, from the roots up to the stems. The roots also need turbo pressure to move into the soil. And they move up through the part called the xylem. So we have the heartwood, we have the xylem, we have the phloem, the cambium, inner bark, and outer bark. And xylem is another great word. You might need that in Scrabble one day. It would be a big score. Xylem is what we call vascular tissue. So vascular means that things, liquid, in this case water, is moving around. We also have a vascular system that moves blood around. So we move our blood with a pump. A heart, a heart pump, or heart is a pump, but plants don't have a heart. So how do they move that water from the roots underground all the way up to the stem to the top of a 200 foot tall redwood tree? Big problem. But they solved that problem. So they solve it, they do that through what we call transpiration. And so plants are involved in the water cycle through this transpiration. So as they're photosynthesizing, they're opening and closing little guard cells under the leaf. Underneath the leaf, there are tiny guard cells that also rely on turbo pressure to open and close. They open to take in carbon dioxide, and then they open again to give off oxygen. Every time they do that, they lose a little bit of water. And so that's why they end up wilting when they don't have more water being added. So this this transpiration creates what we call negative turbo pressure. So it's like a straw. So when I suck up water through a straw, I'm exerting negative pressure. So that's what transpiration does for the, for the plant. So negative turbo pressure is also really important. Now, I have a challenge for you. A month ago, I cut this off my big no pile outside. A month ago, looks pretty good to me. Okay, not wilted, is it? Hmm. This one I cut yesterday, it's not really wilted either. This one I cut yesterday and it looked pretty sad. So, in all these, these are differences. So, particularly evident for the no pile after a month. Why didn't the nopal wilt after one month while the coleus, this one here, wilted in one day? So it's a good thing to fig try to figure out and do some, some research. Okay, so plants are so interesting and I encourage you to learn more and grow your own plants, but don't forget to water them because they need that water to maintain total pressure in their vacuole. Thank you, and I'm going to pass it over to Mr. Broughton for any questions. Thank you, Ms. Nash. The question that came in was, which biomolecule makes up the cell wall of plant cells? And uh, there are four biomolecules. There are carbohydrate, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids. And the one that makes up the cell wall of plant cells is a carbohydrate that Ms. Nash did mention, which is cellulose. And that, by the way, um, is the most abundant organic macromolecule on earth. And uh, that makes sense to me because plants cover most of the earth and um, they are made up of uh, cells that have cell walls. So that, that kind of does make sense. All right, now we're going to move on to uh, geotropism with Mrs. Fuller. Good morning. My name is Mrs. Fuller and we'll be, be talking today about tropisms. Tropisms are a response to a, an organism has to a stimulus. Uh, if the organism goes toward the stimulus, it's considered a positive tropism. If they go away from, it's considered a negative tropism. We've got several different kinds of tropism we see expressed in plants. Uh, the first one is one that you may be real familiar with. If you'll look at this little plant right here, this is a 
a pepper plant, a bell pepper plant, you'll see that all these leaves right here are facing toward the camera. That's because for the past two weeks, it's been up against the wall outside. So the back part has not been exposed to the sun. So these, these leaves are all facing what would be the sun if I hadn't, if I hadn't brought it inside. Now, there is a growth hormone that enables a plant to do that. That hormone is called an auxin. The, the job of the auxin, the, the plant hormone, is to lengthen cells, to make them long. So what happens is the, the, the auxins do not like to be on the same side of the plant where the sun is shining. So they go to the back of the, the plant, the back of the stem, and then they start elongating those cells. And as a result, the plant starts tipping toward the sun. So that's an example of phototropism. Photo means light. And of course, our major source of energy here on our planet is the sun. The second one, well, we're going to talk about more in depth is geotropism. Geotropism is the uh, reaction of a plant to either, uh, either in a positive way, uh, going toward the source, the center of the earth, or going away, uh, growing up. Now, uh, sometimes geotrope is, geo means earth. So sometimes people refer to it as gravitropism because the strongest gravity here on our planet is the planet itself. So if they go toward the center of the earth, in other words, the roots reaching down, some people call that gravitropism instead of geotropism. Another one that you may be familiar with is thigmotropism. I have a morning glory here, and the morning glory, as it grows, wraps around the closest thing to it. You may have seen people have morning glories growing on their fence. Well, as the morning glory uh, little stems touch the fence, they wrap around it. This little morning glory didn't have a fence, so it wrapped around itself. You may be able to see that, how the, the stems are all intertwined there. So that's thigmotropism. Thigmo is the Latin word for touch. And of course, you know it, what a tropism is, response to stimulus. So yeah, there are quite a few different examples of thigmotropism in gardens and in forests. The next one that we uh, want to talk about is hydrotropism. Some, uh, some plants are uh, attracted to water. So if their roots sense the, their water, their roots will grow toward the water. You see this very often in uh, riparian areas where uh, a tree like a willow will send its roots toward the river water. Uh, another one is chemotropism. We're going to talk about that in just a minute after we talk about geotropism. Uh, and all that is is response to chemicals. And uh, there is another one called galvanotropism or electrotropism, which has to do with a, a plant either avoiding or even growing toward electricity. The direction of the response de depends upon the direction of the stimulus. So when we talk about geotropism, a positive response would be the roots in a seed going down toward the earth and the stem growing up would be a negative response. Remember, toward the stimulus, positive. Away from the stimulus, negative. Now I've sprouted some seeds here. We're going to start with some um, radish seeds. And what I did was, let me move this over so that you can see these more closely. I randomly scattered the, the um, radish seeds on this wet paper towel, folded it over, and then I completely sealed it in with aluminum foil. That's so the experiment would not be uh, influenced by sunlight. So we kept them in the dark. It doesn't matter if the seed was in there upside down, right side up or sideways, all of the roots, you can see they're little shiny white roots, all of the roots are going down. When it was stored, it was stored upright like this. 
So here's gravity down here. All of the roots had a positive response and were growing down, geotropism. So I've got another plant here that I also started at the same time. This one is called sorghum. You may be familiar with sorghum because of sorghum syrup. If you've ever had sorghum syrup on your biscuit, well, this is where it came from. Here in the United States, and we also call it millet, uh, it's used for animal food. But you can see all of the sorghum in here, as it reaches down, it doesn't matter if the seed was right side up or upside down or sideways, all of the roots are going down. They're going toward the center of the earth. So let's close him up right there. All right. Now, the, uh, the growth hormone that's associated with uh, geotropism uh, with the going toward the center of the earth is one that's called gibberellin. And that particular growth hormone causes it to go down. Now, this particular plant, the sorghum, has another trick that it does. Uh, when the root hairs emerge in a couple of days, they haven't emerged yet, but they will in a couple of days, they're gonna begin producing, let's see if I have my little, Thing. They're going to be producing uh, root exudate. And all that means is uh, they're going to be oozing out little drops of what looks like pink or brown oil. That is a uh, substance that inhibits photosynthesis, but it doesn't inhibit the photosynthesis on the sorghum. It inhibits the photosynthesis of other seedlings in the area. It's like a weed killer that it grows its own weed killer. And um, that, that particular one is called uh, Sorga Leon. And that one uh, makes it easy that when you grow sorghum, it's going to produce this so that you won't have a lot of weeds in your sorghum field, which is gr great for the farmer. Um, and then an, uh, another plant that does this that's very famous is the black walnut tree. The black walnut tree also puts uh, a chemical, uh, remember chemotropism that the plants you can grow toward or away from. Uh, well, the, the, the chemical that the black walnut puts out is called juglion and, or juglone, and that one keeps away Solanaceae plants. Well, our bell pepper plant, have got a little bell pepper down at the bottom. Uh, the bell pepper plant is a member of the Solanaceae family, as are tomatoes and eggplants and potatoes and uh, plants like that. So they won't grow underneath a black walnut because of this juglone uh, that this chemical that is exuded by the root system and also by the leaves of the um, walnut tree. So plants are very interesting how that they can produce things that will help grow, but also inhibit uh, interlopers onto their territory. Mr. Broughton will be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Fuller. Um, the question that came in was, can we see Another investigation with uh, seeds um, that, that um, investigates geotropism. So I think I found one here. Let me just share my screen with you. And it's right there. This is a uh, seventh grade class. Um, I'm not sure where, they, where that school is, but um, they wanted to investigate geotropism. And again, if the roots grow down, that's a positive reaction. If the stem grows up, that's a negative reaction or response to gravity. And um, let me turn my closed captioning off there. Uh, and even I'll make this bigger so you can see it a little better. But they test the geotropism on corn plants. So Mrs. Fuller used radish seeds and sorghum seeds. These students used corn seeds. And they, again, they isolated that variable of light because they did not want light to be a factor for the plant. So they, they did it a little different um, than Ms. Fuller did, but it's basically the same thing. 
Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead here because this video is too long. But there's the kids putting seeds in a Petri dish, facing the seeds all different directions to make sure that the direction of the seed doesn't have anything to do with um, the, the, the root's reaction to gravity. There they're getting a piece of paper towel to stick in there and um, adding some water to it so that the seeds can germinate. There you can see them add the water. And then they put some cotton balls in there so it can't move around. Seal it up with tape. And then uh, there they taped them inside the doors of a, of a cabinet. So when they close those doors, it's going to be very dark in there. And light will not affect um, the growth of those seeds. And then a little while later, you can see that the seeds did germinate and the roots grow, grew down and the stem grew up. So geotropism worked the same for them as it did for Mrs. Fuller uh, with, uh, with her seeds. And then one other question is what about space? And uh, you know, astronauts are trying to grow plants in outer space, but there is no gravity or I, on, the, on the International Space Station, it's microgravity, but um, that is not enough gravity for plants to respond to so what they do is in the absence of gravity, plants use other environmental factors such as light to orient and guide their growth. A bank of light emitting diodes or LEDs above the plants produces a spectrum of light suited for the plant's growth. So that's why it's so important if we do an investigation here on earth with geotropism that we eliminate that variable of light, but in space they use light to get the plants to grow the right way. All right, now we are going to move on to the circulation of blood with Mr. Monroe. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe, and uh, my portion of your virtual field trip today is to uh, help you explore circulation of blood. Ooh, blood. Kind of reminds me uh, this time of the year when I was a little bitty fella. Uh, I was a scary little fella. I was scared to go around behind the house that I was born and raised in if it was dark for fear there might be vampires. <laughs> but I'm a grown man now and I put all of that aside. The circulation of blood in animals is very important. It's life sustaining to all animals that have that blood flow in them. If it's interrupted, it can be detrimental to the health and the life of that organism. Now, before we get started, I want to remind you students that there is an organization in living things. It starts with cells because they are organized into tissues. Tissues are organized into organs. Organs are organized into systems and systems form the organism. Well, within a organism, we know that there are a lot of systems. And within the system that I'm talking about or referring to today, that's called the uh, circulatory system, there are a lot of organs that are working together to provide blood circulation. Now, I will tell you that the pumping action that goes on within an organism to circulate that blood basically is the cardiac muscle. And I have a picture of a cardiac muscle here. It's the human heart. Now, actually, the human heart acts as a dual pump operation. It's a very strong muscle. In fact, I found out here recently that uh, being examined by cardiologists I had a very strong heart muscle, which is the focal point of the circulation system. Within that system, there are blood vessels that fall into three major classes. Arteries or arterioles carry blood away from the heart. That's their job. Veins and venules carry blood to the heart. Capillaries allow the exchange of nutrients, waste, and gas. So the circulatory system, which circulates blood within an animal system, is responsible for transporting gases, nutrients, waste, and hormones. Now, when we talk about the circulatory system, 
we're actually talking about there are two kinds. One is called an open system, the other is called a closed system. Arthropods and most mollusks have what we call an open circulatory system. Now the hemolymph is contained in a body cavity, the hemocell, and within that body cavity there are a series of hearts. Now that would be described, and this is not a real grasshopper, but it is a model of a grasshopper that, and we know that grasshoppers are a member of the arthropod group. So, you know, up until this time when I did this little bit of research about the circulatory system, I was not aware that within the hemocell of this organism, there are a series of hearts. Now with humans, we have one heart that actually has four chambers. This guy, this kind of animal, has a series of hearts. And there are other mollusks, uh, mollusks that also have the same situation. Now, with humans, vertebrates, annelid worms, and a few mollusks, they have a closed circulated, circulatory uh, system. And what that means is blood is moved through the blood vessels by the heart's action, a contraction. It does not come in direct contact with the organs. Now, the simplest vertebrate heart, guess what? It's a two-chambered heart. And most of the time, we will find a two-chambered heart in fish. And of course, most reptiles and amphibians, they have a three-chambered heart. Mammals and birds have a four-chambered heart and this allows for the separation of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood to flow in the circulatory system, okay? Now, students, I have a couple of organisms that I wanna share with you today that fall into those different categories. Here, I have a little beetle that is considered to be an amazing little beetle. This is a best bug or Betsy bug. It is a member of the arthropod group. So does it have a open system or is it a closed system? I would say most likely because it's an arthropod, it definitely has what we call an open system. You know, the part that gets me, because we have a closed system as a member of the vertebrate group, we know that if we were involved in a big accident and one of our limbs was severed, removed from our body, and there was no assistance, no first aid, nothing done to help us out. Because of the construction of our circulatory system, most likely we would bleed to death. Have you ever seen a grasshopper bleed to death simply because one of his legs come off? <laughs> so I guess, there is a benefit for having that open system versus the closed system. I don't know. That gives you something to think about. Now, as far as an uh, amphibian who has a three-chambered heart, let me get another one of my little friends out. This is Hoppy the Bullfrog. Now, Hoppy the Bullfrog is an amphibian. Now, that means that he has a three-chambered heart. Now, I know that sometime in the past, even when I used to teach science, the students would always teach science in the regular classroom, but the students would always ask me, are we going to dissect frogs today? Well, we're not going to dissect old Hoppy here. He's a good guy. I use him in a lot of the lessons that I present out here. He is considered to be an amphibian, so he has a three-chambered heart. To help us kind of investigate his systems, I have a diagram of a frog up here, a model. And of course, he's all puffed up because he's kind of excited. But if we look at this diagram, right here is a frog's heart. And we can see that from that frog's heart, we do have some arteries that are coming down and probably behind it, there are some veins. We know that the veins, actually are taking blood away from the heart. Uh, pulmonary veins 
usually flow blood into the lungs. Now, the arteries, guess what? They're taking the blood away from the heart. And it's all connected, so it constantly goes on. Also, there's another organ called the liver. The liver is used to filter out toxins or things that would not be good to be in the blood. That's the primary job of the liver, and it's located right in here, okay? But that's old Hoppy. He is considered to be an amphibian. And one more interesting thing I found out about frogs is that it's very important that their skin stays wet or moist, simply because, I guess, they cannot obtain enough oxygen like we do through our noses, through our breathing process. So what happens is their skin has to stay moist because they also pull oxygen in from the air through the pores in their skin. Okay, Hoppy, it's okay. Okay? So if this frog skin dried up, it would almost be like asphyxiation. He would not get enough oxygen to stay alive over a long period of time. I've got another animal I want to show you. Even though this turtle lives a lot of, or spends a lot of time in water. This is considered to be a reptile. You heard me say that amphibians like hoppy and reptiles like this turtle, they have how many uh, chambers in their heart? They have three chambers. And of course, somewhere inside here, this red ear slider, it's got a muscle, cardiac muscle, called a heart. And it is pumping, it's exerting pressure to send that blood through the circulatory system in its body. Now I will tell you this, one thing I forgot to mention to you is that because of the job that arteries are doing, they're taking the blood away from the heart, the epithelial lining of those arteries has to be very durable because the arteries are under a lot of pressure moving that blood into the circulatory system away from the heart. The veins, the epithelial, epithelial uh, lining might be a little weaker. In fact, I will tell you the veins are not as strong as the arteries simply because they're taking blood into the heart. So hopefully I've given you a, a little better understanding of how circulatory systems work in a variety of animals that have to have that sustaining fluid that we call blood circulate through their body. So if any of you have any questions, I'm going to turn it back over to Mr. Broughton and maybe he can answer them. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. We're going to do a quick recap of uh, what we did today. So today's uh, field trip was all about forces that affect motion in organisms. During this virtual field trip, students discovered that there is a relationship among force, motion, and energy. Students observed forces that affect motion in organisms, such as the emergence of seedlings, trigger pressure, geotropism, and the circulation of blood. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to learn about forces that affect motion in organisms with us, and we would like to know what you think about this field trip. How you let us know what you think is by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and filling out a short feedback form to let us know what you thought. Uh, we hope to see you again in three more weeks and have a great rest of your day. Goodbye.